Life of Bunyan, Chapters 7, 8, and 9 Bunyan was now halfway through his forty-fourth year. Sixteen years still remained to him before his career of indefatigable service in the Master's work was brought to a close. Of these sixteen years we have only a very general knowledge. Details are wanting, nor is there any known source from which they can be recovered. If he kept a diary, it has not been preserved. If he wrote letters, and one who was looked up to by so large a circle of disciples as a spiritual father and guide, and whose pen was so ready of exercise, cannot fail to have written many, not one has come down to us. But the little that is recorded of him is eminently characteristic. We see him constantly engaged in the great work to which he felt God had called him, and for which, with much content through grace, he had suffered twelve years' incarceration. In addition to the regular discharge of his pastoral duties to his own congregation, he took a general oversight of the villages far and near which had been the scene of his earlier ministry, preaching whenever opportunity offered, and ever unsparing of his own personal labor, making long journeys into distant parts of the country for the furtherance of the gospel. Almost the first thing Bunyan did, after his liberation from jail, was to apply to government for licenses for preachers and preaching places in Bedfordshire and neighboring counties, under the Declaration of Indulgence. Twenty-five preachers and thirty-one buildings are known to have been licensed through his efforts, over these religious communities Bunyan exercised a quasi-episcopal superintendence which gained for him the playful title of Bishop Bunyan. With his time so largely occupied in his spiritual functions, he could have had but small leisure to devote to his worldly calling. This, however, one of so honest and independent a spirit is sure not to have neglected. He had a family to maintain, and his congregation were mostly of the poor sort— unable to contribute much to their pastor's support. It is beyond all doubt that though his ministerial duties were his chief concern, he prudently kept fast hold of his handicraft as a certain means of support for himself and those dependent on him. On the whole, Bunyan's outward circumstances were probably easy. His wants were very few and easily supplied. Having food and raiment for himself, his wife, and his children, he was therewith content. His home was a small cottage, such as laborers now occupy, with three small rooms on the ground floor, and a garret with a diminutive dormer window under the high-pitched tile roof. Beside stood an outbuilding, which served as his workshop. One who visited him found the contents of his study hardly larger than those of his prison cell. They were limited to a Bible and copies of The Pilgrim's Progress, and a few other books, chiefly his own works, all lying on a shelf or shelves. Bunyan's celebrity as a preacher continued to increase. Wherever he ministered, sometimes when troublous days returned, in woods and dells and other hiding places, the announcement that John Bunyan was to preach gathered a large and attentive auditory, hanging on his lips and drinking from them the words of life. His earliest biographer, Charles Doe, the honest comb-maker at the foot of London Bridge, tells us, I have seen, by my computation, about twelve hundred at a morning lecture by seven o'clock on a working day, in the dark winter time. This was in London. I also computed, he goes on, about three thousand that came to hear him one Lord's Day in London, so that half were fain to go back again for want of room, and then himself was fain at a back door to be pulled almost over people to get upstairs to his pulpit. On one of his occasional visits to London, he delivered his striking sermon on The Greatness of the Soul and the Unspeakableness of the Loss Thereof, first published in 1683. He often preached in Dr. Owen's meeting-house, in White's Abbey, or Moorsfield's, which was the gathering-place for titled folk, city merchants, and other nonconformists of position and degree. Bunyan was more than once urged to leave Bedford and settle in the metropolis, but to all these solicitations he turned a deaf ear. No prospect of a wider field of usefulness, still less of a larger income, could tempt him to desert his few sheep in the wilderness, his Bedford flock. 
Some of them, it is true, were wayward sheep. Brother John Stanton had to be admonished for abusing his wife and beating her often for very light matters, and Sister Mary Foskett for privately whispering of a horrid scandal without color of truth against Brother Honeylove. But though Bunyan's flock contained some whose fleeces were not as white as he desired, the congregation must have been on the whole a quiet, God-fearing, spiritually-minded folk of whom their pastor could think with thankfulness and satisfaction as his hope and joy and crown of rejoicing. At Bedford, therefore, he remained. Bunyan's peace was not, however, altogether undisturbed. The Declaration of Indulgence, under which Bunyan was liberated in 1672, was very short-lived. Granted on the 15th of March of that year, it was withdrawn in March of the following year, and Bunyan and his fellow nonconformists were in a position of greater peril, as far as the letter of the law was concerned, than ever before. Unhappily for Bunyan, the parties in whose hands the execution of the penal statutes against nonconformists rested in Bedfordshire were not likely to let them lie inactive. A warrant was issued for his apprehension without delay. It is dated the 4th of March, and bears the signature of no fewer than thirteen magistrates, ten of them affixing their seals, a significant indication of the importance attached to Bunyan's imprisonment by the gentry of the country. Once more, then, Bunyan became a prisoner, and that, there can be little doubt, in his old quarters in the Bedford jail. This last imprisonment lasted only half as many months as his former imprisonment had lasted years. At the end of six months he was again a free man, thanks to the good offices of Owen, Cromwell's celebrated chaplain, with Barlow, Bishop of Lincoln. This short imprisonment assumes great importance from the probability, now become almost a certainty, that it was during this period that Bunyan began, if he did not also complete, the first part of the Pilgrim's Progress. The break which occurs in the narrative after the visit of the pilgrims to the delectable mountains, which so unnecessarily interrupts the course of the story. So I awoke from my dream, and I slept and dreamed again, seems to indicate the point Bunyan had reached when his six months' imprisonment ended, and from which he continued the book after his release. The first part of The Pilgrim's Progress was issued from the press in 1678, a second edition followed in the same year, and a third, with large and important additions, in 1679. The second part, after an interval of seven years, followed early in 1685. Between the two parts appeared two of his most celebrated works, the Life and Death of Mr. Badman, published in 1680, originally intended to supply a contrast and a foil to the Pilgrim's Progress, by depicting a life which was scandalously bad, and, in 1682, that which Macaulay has said would have been our greatest allegory if the earlier allegory had not been written, the holy war made by Shaddai upon Diabolus. There is little more to record in Bunyan's life. Though never again seriously troubled for his nonconformity, his preaching journeys were not always without risk. There is a tradition that when he visited Reading to preach he disguised himself as a wagoneer, carrying a long whip in his hand to escape detection. The name of Bunyan's Dell, in a wood not very far from Hitchin, tells of the time when he and his hearers had to conceal their meetings from the enemy's quest, with scouts planted on every side to warn them of the approach of the spies and informers, who for reward were actively plying their odious trade. Towards the close of the year, 1685, the persecution of the nonconformists raged with extreme fierceness. Never, not even under the tyranny of Laud, had the condition of the Puritans been so deplorable. Dissenting ministers, however blameless in life, however eminent in learning, could not venture to walk the streets for fear of outrages, which not only were not repressed, but were encouraged by those whose duty it was to preserve the peace. Richard Baxter was in prison. Howe was afraid to show himself in London, and had been driven to Utrecht. Not a few who had up to that time borne up boldly, lost heart and fled the kingdom. Through many subsequent years the autumn of 1685 was remembered as a time of misery and terror. 
There is, however, no indication of Bunyan having been molested. The deed of gift, by which at this time he sought to avoid the confiscation of his goods, conveying his goods, chattels, debts, ready money, plate, rings, household stuff, apparel, utensils, brass, pewter, bedding, and all other his substance whatsoever, to his well-beloved wife, Elizabeth Bunyan, was never called into exercise. Indeed, its very existence was forgotten. Hidden away in a recess in his house in St. Cuthbert's, this interesting document was accidentally discovered at the beginning of the present century, and is preserved among the most valued treasures of the congregation which bears his name. Quieter times for nonconformists were, however, at hand. James the Second, despairing of employing the Tories and the churchmen as his tools, turned, as his brother had turned before him, to the dissenters, the snare being craftily baited as before with a new declaration of indulgence. But with all his ardent desire for religious liberty, Bunyan was too keen-witted not to see through James's policy, and too honest to give it any direct support. He clearly saw that it was not for any love of the dissenters that they were so suddenly delivered from their persecutions and placed on a kind of equality with the church. The king's object was the establishment of popery. Zealous as Bunyan was for the liberty of prophesying, even that might be purchased at too high a price. An attempt was made to buy his support by the offer of some place under government. The bribe was indignantly rejected. Bunyan even refused to see the government agent who offered it. He would by no means come to him, but sent his excuse. Behind the treacherous sunshine he saw a dark cloud, ready to burst. The Ninevites' remedy he felt was now called for, so he gathered his congregation together and appointed a day of fasting and prayer to avert the danger that, under a specious pretext, again menaced their civil and religious liberties. A true, sturdy Englishman, Bunyan, with Baxter and Howe, refused an indulgence which could only be purchased by the violent overthrow of the law. Bunyan did not live to see the revolution of 1688. In August of that year the pilgrim's earthly progress ended, and he was bidden to cross the dark river, which has no bridge. The summons came to him in the very midst of his religious activity, both as a preacher and as a writer. His pen had never been more busy than when he was bidden to lay it down finally. Early in 1688, after a two years' silence, attributable perhaps to the political troubles of the time, his Jerusalem Sinner Saved, or A Help to Despairing Souls, one of the best known and most powerfully characteristic of his works, had issued from the press, and had been followed by four others, The Work of Jesus Christ as an Advocate, a poetical composition entitled The Building, Nature, and Excellency of the House of God, The Water of Life, and Solomon's Temple Spiritualized. At the time of his death he was occupied in seeing through the press a sixth book, The Acceptable Sacrifice, which was published after his funeral. In addition to these, Bunyan left behind him no fewer than fourteen works in manuscript, all of which were subsequently published. Bunyan's end was in keeping with his life. He had ever sought to be a peacemaker and to reconcile differences, and thus had hindered many mishaps and saved many families from ruin. His last effort of the kind indirectly caused his death. The father of a young man in whom he took an interest had resolved, on some offense, real or supposed, to disinherit his son. The young man sought Bunyan's mediation. Anxious to heal the breach, Bunyan mounted his horse and took the long journey to Reading, where he pleaded the offender's cause so effectually as to obtain a promise of forgiveness. Bunyan returned homeward through London, where he was appointed to preach. His forty miles ride to London was through heavy, driving rain. He was weary and drenched to the skin when he reached the house of his very loving friend, John Strudwick, deacon of the nonconformist meeting in Red Cross Street. A few months before, Bunyan had suffered from the sweating sickness. The exposure caused a return of the malady, and though well enough to fulfill his pulpit engagement on Sunday the 19th of August, on the following Tuesday dangerous symptoms declared themselves, and in ten days the disease proved fatal. 
he died within two months of completing his sixtieth year on the thirty first of august sixteen eighty eight just a month before the publication of the declaration of the prince of orange opened a new era of civil and religious liberty he was buried in mr strudwick's newly purchased vault in the burial ground in finsbury a place which has been called the campo santo of dissenters where watts and owen and the wesleys and many other famous in the annals of nonconformity await the resurrection day no account of bunyan's funeral has been preserved although doubtless in accordance with the custom of the time it was an imposing one the literary renown of the great dreamer and his great reputation in london as a preacher would assuredly gather great numbers to the mournful scene but the only record we have of any demonstration on the occasion of his death is that of a sorrowful meeting of his own bedford flock on the wednesday following the news of his death and of the appointment that the next wednesday also should be kept in prayer and humiliation on the same account the new sepulchre in which he was laid was doubtless bought by john strudwick for his honored friend there ten years later his own remains were laid a tomb was erected over the grave and was later replaced by one bearing bunyan's effigy by his first wife whose christian name is nowhere recorded bunyan had four children two sons and two daughters and by his second wife the heroic elizabeth one son and one daughter all of them survived except his eldest daughter mary his tenderly loved blind child who died before him his wife only survived him for a brief period following her faithful pilgrim from this world to the other whither he was gone before her either in sixteen ninety one or sixteen ninety two bunyan's character and person are thus described by his earliest biographer charles doe he appeared in countenance to be of a stern and rough temper but in his conversation he was mild and affable not given to loquacity or much discourse in company unless some urgent occasion required it observing never to boast of himself or his parts but rather to seem low in his own eyes and submit himself to the judgment of others abhorring lying and swearing being just in all that lay in his power to his word not seeming to revenge injuries loving to reconcile differences and make friendships with all he had a sharp quick eye with an excellent discerning of persons being of good judgment and quick wit he was tall of stature strong-boned though not corpulent somewhat of a ruddy face with sparkling eyes wearing his hair on his upper lip after the old british fashion his hair reddish but in his later days time had sprinkled it with gray his nose well set but not declining or bending his mouth moderately large his forehead something high and his habit always plain and modest not puffed up in prosperity nor shaken in adversity always holding the golden mean we may add the portrait drawn by one who has been his companion and fellow sufferer for many years john nelson his countenance was grave and sedate and did so to the life discover the inward frame of his heart that it was convincing to beholders and did strike something of awe into them that had nothing of the fear of god an anecdote is told that one day when he had preached with peculiar warmth and enlargement one of his hearers remarked what a sweet sermon he had delivered i was bunyan's reply you have no need to tell me that for the devil whispered it to me before i was well out of the pulpit as an evidence of the estimation in which bunyan was held by the highly educated it is recorded that charles the second expressed his surprise to dr owen that a learned man such as he could sit and listen to an illiterate tinker may it please your majesty owen replied i would gladly give up all my learning if i could preach like that tinker although much of bunyan's literary activity was devoted to controversy he had none of the narrowness or bitter spirit of a controversialist it is true that his zeal for what he deemed to be truth led him into vehemence of language in dealing with those whom he regarded as its perverters but the intensity of speech was coupled with the utmost charity of spirit towards those who differed from him external differences he regarded as insignificant when he found real christian faith and love 
the only persons he scrupled to hold communion with were those whose lives were openly immoral. Divisions about non-essentials, he said, were to churches what wars were to countries. Those who talk most about religion cared least for it, and controversies about doubtful things and things of little moment ate up all zeal for things which were practical and indisputable. His last sermon breathed the same Catholic spirit, free from the trammels of narrow sectarianism. Its closing words are such as deserve to be written in letters of gold as the sum of all true Christian teaching. Be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Consider that the holy God is your Father, and let this oblige you to live like the children of God, that you may look your Father in the face with comfort another day. By the Catholic spirit which breathes through his writings, especially through the Pilgrim's Progress, the tinker of Elstow has become the teacher, not of any particular sect, but of the universal church. CHAPTER Eight. Bunyan, as we have seen, was a very copious author. His collected works fill three bulky quarto volumes, each of nearly eight hundred double-columned pages in small type, and this copiousness of production is combined with a general excellence in the matter produced. While few of his books approach the high standard of The Pilgrim's Progress, or Holy War, none, it may truly be said, sink very far below that standard. The great charm which pervades all Bunyan's writings is their naturalness. You never feel that he is writing for effect, still less to perform an uncongenial piece of task-work. He wrote as he spoke, because a necessity was laid upon him which he could not evade. His errand was much too serious, and the need and danger of others too urgent, to waste time in tricking out his words with human skill. And it is just this which, with all their rudeness, their occasional bad grammar, and homely colloquialisms, gives to Bunyan's writings a power of riveting the attention and stirring the affections which few writers have attained to. The pent-up fire glows in every line and kindles the hearts of his readers. Beautiful images, vivid expressions, forcible arguments, all aglow with passion, tender pleadings, solemn warnings, make those who read him all eye, all ear, all soul. Bunyan's verse compositions, which are numerous, do not entitle him to high rank as a poet, although they are far removed from the doggerel. His ear for rhythm, says Mr. Frode, though less true than in his prose, is seldom wholly at fault, and whether in prose or verse, he had the superlative merit that he could never write nonsense. His earliest prison work, entitled Profitable Meditations, was in verse, but neither this nor his later metrical verses before his release, his Four Last Things, his Ebal and Gerizim, and his Prison Meditations, show as much power as his later efforts in verse. The Prison Meditations are the most interesting of his earlier poems, from the picture they present of Bunyan's prison life, and of the courageous faith that sustained him. His captivity was sweetened by the thought of what it was that brought him there. I here am very much refreshed to think, when I was out, I preached life and peace and rest to sinners round about. My business then was souls to save by preaching grace and faith, of which the comfort now I have, and have it shall till death. He is very content to suffer or even to die for his profession. The prison very sweet to me hath been since I came here, and so would also hanging be if God would there appear. To them that here for evil lie this place is comfortless, but not to me, because that I lie here for righteousness. As Bunyan advanced in his literary career, his claim to the title of poet, though never of the highest, was strengthened. The verses which diversify the narrative in the second part of The Pilgrim's Progress are decidedly superior to those in the first part, and some are of high excellence. Who is ignorant of the charming little song of the shepherd boy in the Valley of Humiliation, or of the still higher flight in Valiant for Truth's song, 
who would true valour see let him come hither all readers of the pilgrim's progress and the holy war are familiar with the long metrical compositions giving the history of these works by which they are prefaced and the latter work is closed no more characteristic examples of bunyan's muse can be found they show his excellent command of his native tongue in racy vernacular homely but never vulgar and his power of expressing his meaning with sharp defined outlines and without the waste of a word a perusal of the little volume published three years after his death under the title of country rhymes for children later known as divine embers with all its roughness and quaintness sometimes grating on the ear but full of strong thought and picturesque images cannot fail to raise bunyan's pretensions as a poet his muse it is true as alexander smith has said is a homely one she is clad in russet wears shoes and stockings has a country accent and walks along the level bedfordshire roads but if the lines are unpolished they have pith and sinew like the talk of a shrewd peasant with the strong thought and the knack of the skilled workman who can drive by a single blow the nail home to its head by far the most important of the works written during bunyan's long imprisonment is the grace abounding in which with inimitable earnestness and simplicity he gives the story of his early life and his religious history this book if he had written no other would stamp bunyan as one of the greatest masters of the english language of his own or any other age in graphic delineation of the struggles of a conscience convicted of sin towards a hardly won freedom and peace the alternations of light and darkness of hope and despair which checkered its course its morbid self-torturing questions of motive and action this work of the travelling tinker as a spiritual history has never been surpassed its equal can hardly be found save in the confessions of st augustine which however though describing a like spiritual conflict are couched in a more cultured style and rise to a higher metaphysical region than bunyan was capable of attaining to his level is a lower one but on that level he was without rival never has the history of a soul been portrayed in more nervous and awe-inspiring language and its awfulness is enhanced by its self-evident truth it is impossible to overestimate the value of the grace abounding both for the facts of bunyan's earlier life and for the spiritual experience of which those facts were in his eyes only the outward framework its importance for our knowledge of bunyan as a man as distinguished from an author and of the circumstances of his life is seen by a comparison of our acquaintance with his earlier and with his later years when he laid down the pen no one took it up and beyond two or three facts and a few hazy anecdotes we know little or nothing of all that happened between his final release and his death the value of the grace abounding however as a work of experimental religion may be easily overestimated bunyan's unhappy mode of dealing with the bible as a collection of texts each containing a definite meaning entirely irrespective of its context is utterly destructive of the true purpose of the holy scripture as a revelation of god's loving and holy mind and will and it is not many who can study bunyan's minute history of the various stages of his spiritual life with real profit only those who have known by experience the force of bunyan's spiritual combat can fully appreciate and profit by bunyan's narrative for such the grace abounding to the chief of sinners will ever prove most valuable as has been said bunyan's pen was almost idle during the last six years of his imprisonment only two of his works were produced during this period his confessions of faith and his defense of the doctrine of justification by faith the object of the former work was to vindicate his teachings and if possible to secure his liberty his professed principles he asserts are faith and holiness springing therefrom with an endeavor so far as is in him to be at peace with all men he will not quarrel about things that are circumstantial the defense of the doctrine of justification by faith is entirely controversial being inspired by a book entitled 
The Design of Christianity, by Fowler, afterwards Bishop of Gloucester. Fowler's doctrines, as Bunyan understood them, or rather misunderstood them, awoke the worst side of his impetuous nature. His vituperation of the author and his book is coarse and unmeasured. No excuse can be offered for it, but it was much in the fashion of the time. In this work Bunyan errs in unduly asserting the absolute, irredeemable corruption of human nature, leaving nothing for grace to work upon, but demanding an absolutely fresh creation, not a revivication of the divine nature, grievously marred, but not annihilated by Adam's sin. CHAPTER Nine. The characteristics that distinguish Bunyan as a writer are most conspicuous in the works by which he is chiefly known— the Pilgrim's Progress, The Holy War, Grace Abounding, and we may add, though from the repulsiveness of the subject the book is little read, The Life and Death of Mr. Badman. One great charm of these works, especially of The Pilgrim's Progress, lies in the pure Saxon English in which they are written, which makes them models of English speech. In no book, writes Mr. J. R. Green, do we see more clearly than in The Pilgrim's Progress the imaginative force which had been given to the common life of Englishmen by their study of the Bible. Bunyan's English is the simplest and homeliest English that has ever been used by any great writer, but it is the English of the Bible. His images are the images of prophet and evangelist. So completely had the Bible become Bunyan's life that we feel its phrases as the natural expression of his thoughts, he had lived in the Bible till its words became his own. The chief characteristic of Bunyan's writings is the richness of his imaginative power. A lifelike power of characterization belongs in the highest degree to the Pilgrim's Progress, and is hardly inferior in the Holy War. The secret of this graphic power is that Bunyan describes men and women such as he had seen and known them. He had to do with every one of them. He could have given a personal name to most of them, and we could do the same to many. The same reality characterized the descriptive part of the Pilgrim's Progress. The scenery and surroundings of his allegory are part of his own everyday life. He had known what it was to be in danger of falling into a pit and being dashed to pieces with vain confidence, of being drowned on the flooded meadows with Christian and Hopeful, Vanity Fair is evidently drawn from the life. The great yearly fair of Sturbridge, close to Cambridge, furnished him with materials for the picture. The Pilgrim's Progress exhibits Bunyan in the character by which he would most have desired to be remembered, as one of the most influential of Christian preachers. Hallam, however, claims for him another distinction which would have greatly startled and probably shocked him, as the father of our English novelists. As an allegorist, Bunyan had many predecessors, but he was the first to break ground in the field of fictitious biography. Whatever its deficiencies, literary and religious, may be, the fact of its universal popularity with readers of all classes and all orders of intellect remains, and gives this book a unique distinction. One secret of the universal acceptableness of The Pilgrim's Progress lies in the breadth of its religious sympathies. To quote from Mr. Frode, The Pilgrim's Progress, though in Puritan dress, is a genuine man. His experience is so truly human experience that Christians of every persuasion can identify themselves with him. We, too, every one of us, are pilgrims on the same road, and images and illustrations come back to us from so faithful an intimacy as we encounter similar trials and learn for ourselves the accuracy with which Bunyan has described them. Time cannot impair its interest, or intellectual progress make it cease to be true to experience. The second part of The Pilgrim's Progress partakes of the character of all continuations, and is in great measure only a reverberation of the first part. But though it is inferior on the whole to the first, it is a work of striking originality and graphic power, such as Bunyan alone could have written. Everywhere we find strokes of his peculiar genius, and though in a smaller measure than the first, it has added not a few portraits to Bunyan's spiritual picture gallery, which we should be sorry to miss, 
and supplied us with racy sayings which stick to the memory. But with all its excellencies, and there are many, the general inferiority of the history of Christiana and her children's pilgrimage must be acknowledged. The story is less skillfully constructed, the interest is sometimes allowed to flag, the dialogues that interrupt the narrative are in places dry and wearisome, too much of sermons in disguise. On the whole, we may well be content that Bunyan never carried out the idea hinted at at the closing of his allegory. Shall it be my lot to go that way again? I may give those that desire it an account of what I am here silent about. In the meantime I bid my reader adieu. Bunyan's second great allegorical work, The Holy War, is an attempt to clothe what writers on divinity call the plan of salvation in a figurative dress. In the nature of things such an attempt cannot be perfectly successful. The narrative, with all its vividness and description in parts, its clearly drawn characters with their picturesque nomenclature, and the stirring vicissitudes of the drama, is necessarily wanting in the personal interest which attaches to an individual man, like Christian, and those who are linked with or follow his career. The narrative moves in a more shadowy region, an undefined sense of unreality pursues us through the story, which, however, draws its scenes and circumstances, and to some extent its dramatis personae, from the writer's own surroundings in the town and corporation at Bedford, and his brief but stirring experience as a soldier in the great parliamentary war. The catastrophe, also, is eminently unsatisfactory. After all the endless vicissitudes of the conflict, and the final glorious victory of Emmanuel and his forces, and the execution of the ringleaders of the mutiny, the issue still remains doubtful. The town of Mansoul is left open to fresh attacks, and its worst enemies are still at large. One more work of Bunyan's still remains to be briefly noticed, as bearing the characteristic stamp of his genius, the life and death of Mr. Badman. The original design of this book was to furnish a contrast to the Pilgrim's Progress. It is, however, totally unlike the latter, both in form and execution. The one is an allegory, the other a tale, describing, without imagery or metaphor, in the plainest language, the career of a vulgar, middle-class, unprincipled scoundrel. It is certainly remarkable, if an offensive, book. We can hardly believe that we have not a real history before us. We feel that there is no reason why the events recorded should not have happened. There are no surprises, no unlooked-for catastrophes, no providential interpositions to punish the sinner or rescue the good man. Bad man's pious wife is made to pay the penalty of allowing herself to be deceived by a tall, good-looking, hypocritical scoundrel. He himself pursues his evil way to the end, sinning on to the last, and dying with a heart that cannot repent. End of Section 5 This is the end of A Memoir of the Author by Canon Edmonds Venerables